Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit. Let's have a gander at Necropolis, a diabolical dungeon delve from a company called Hairbrain Schemes, responsible, of course, for Shadowrun Returns, Shadowrun Hong Kong, Shadowrun uh, Dragonfall, and the forthcoming Battletech game. This is the first game they've done that hasn't been crowdfunded, which is a bit strange. They've been very successful with the crowdfunding, and isn't that one of the key rules of success? Make sure you spend somebody else's money? Well, it seemed to work out pretty well for them, but thankfully they also made a bunch of good games with that money, so it's not really something that I can hold against them. So this is the demo of their forthcoming roguelite souls-like dungeon exploration game called Necropolis. And you might immediately notice the striking art style for this particular title, which uses a lot of flat shading. Which works surprisingly well, actually. You know, you'd think that, especially in the era of games like Dark Souls 3 that have a fairly absurd amount of detail included in the environment that other games would try and follow suit. This game actually went for a more minimalistic, spartan approach to the aesthetic, but it still looks good. I think it looks quite distinct, so give them credit for that. Let's check out the various controls here, and you'll immediately notice that the weapon I have has a chargeable special move associated with it. I can do either light attacks with my sword, a combo of those, or I can do a charged up heavy attack, which in this case, with this particular weapon, does a series of flurries and spins, which will hit multiple targets. Now, the interesting thing about this particular system is that while it drains stamina, which is very similar to Dark Souls, if you keep doing it, it's actually going to block off some of the stamina bar there. It's going to reserve it, and this represents your character getting tired, and this can be countered only by eating food and resting. So you can do a few special moves here and there, and they're of course very powerful, but if you keep doing them, you're going to start running out of stamina on a more permanent basis, and the last thing you want to do is run out of stamina, which will disable your ability to dodge and block and counter and all that sort of thing in a fight. Now immediately you notice that the combat is relatively similar to the Souls games. You've got your parry and you've got your repost. It's a relatively slow combat system in which the enemies telegraph their attacks. But it also has a little bit of a 3D Zelda feel to it as well. In fact, the entire game sort of does in the sense that it's a little bit more lighthearted, a little bit more colorful in something like Dark Souls, which is of course a misery simulator. This game actually has quite an interesting sense of humor going along to it, and you'll probably notice when I'm interacting with the giant pyramid eye god thingy that gives me the various quests to do within this procedurally generated dungeon that there's an interesting sense of humor involved. What you might also notice as part of the combat is that every enemy actually drops its weapon, and these weapons are Interesting in the sense that they don't directly tell you whether or not they're any good. You have to read the description, you can also see what the tier level is on this weapon. Which is going to give you a rough indication of how powerful it is, but it's not necessarily going to tell you whether or not it's better than the weapon you've got. Now each of these weapons has a different set of animations and attacks as well as characteristics, but they deliberately obfuscate those characteristics. And part of that is the roguelike or roguelite heritage that this game inherits. It's not Dark Souls although it has various aspects that are quite similar to Dark Souls, it's deliberately hiding information from the player and it's leaving it up to you to figure out which weapon you want to use. Now, some people are going to object to that level of obfuscation. I'm actually kind of one of them. I don't like hiding that information from the player. I don't think it's all that helpful. There are some systems in which I think it's acceptable. For instance, in this game in particular, you can get unidentified potions and magical scrolls. So that's a very Diablo-esque idea. But this game actually lets you use them without knowing what they are. As you are going to see later in this footage, that's actually kind of risky and could really get you killed because some of those potions and scrolls have negative effects. But it gives you a reason to stock up on scrolls of identify and things like that in the dungeon itself. Now, speaking of the dungeon, I did say it's procedurally generated. The starting hub area is the same every time, but as soon as you go through the door, you will be accessing a different dungeon every time you go down here. And that's important because the game has permadeath. Your character, once it's dead, is gone for good. However, there is an element of permanence in the sense that you can gain tokens of favor from the brazen head god over here, and you can use those tokens of favor to unlock different passive bonuses and abilities, which are going to transfer on to your next character when you invariably die horribly in the dungeon. Speaking of the dungeon, let's go wander on into it. You'll notice there's a 
vendor here. You're going to find vendors in the various levels of the dungeon in the hubs. Each level of the dungeon has a hub area, which has various things you can buy. You can stock up on rations and scrolls of identify and potentially buy a weapon. You can also buy dyes, as you can notice here, which will let you color your character and make it look a little bit different. Those, however, do require tokens of favor, so... Maybe not such a good idea. You may have also noticed down the bottom that there were a series of quests that popped up there, and they're given by the Brazen God, and you're expected to do them on the level, and if you're able to complete those sub-objectives during this level, then you will be given tokens of favor as a reward. So I have no idea what's behind this door, of course, as I mentioned earlier, because this level is going to be completely different every time I do a playthrough, and I did quite a few playthroughs in which I died horribly. The demo was limited to 15 minutes. I didn't usually last that long, so... Because, of course, you immediately walk in and a trap is activated. It's definitely not pleasant. Oh, God! And there we go. You can clearly see that it is certainly Dark Souls in the aspect that they like to hide their enemies around the place. As you kill your enemies, you're going to be able to pick up different crafting items, which will allow you to craft on the fly. You can mix a potion, for instance, in the middle of a dungeon, but it does take a little bit of time. So you can go to your crafting menu, you start to mix the potion up, and it actually gets the little... Bottles out and does the little mixing animation, which I thought was kind of great, but doing that in the middle of combat is a terrible idea. It does, however, give you a reason to explore and collect these uh, different pieces, and of course you can get different recipes as you go through the game, as well as acquiring the diamond currency, which can be used to buy weapons and items from vendors. You actually get quite a lot. I do appreciate the fact that all of these crafting items are auto pickup. You don't have to worry about picking those up. Although if you do want to grab a weapon off the ground, you will have to manually do that. And I noticed, unfortunately, in, in the game, there's a little bit of a problem when items tend to drop on top of each other because the game can't differentiate right now between what item you're trying to pick up and what item you're trying to ignore, which is a bit of a pain in the ass there. You can swap out for a cracked longsword if you wish, but that is a tier zero weapon, so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stick with that and see if we can get a bit of a better weapon, which, as I mentioned before, it has different attack animations and things like that available for it. Now, I'm currently fighting Screamers, which are a damn nightmare. They will summon a huge number of enemies, which is going to make the situation very difficult, and I shouldn't have really waited around there. I wanted to check out what that weapon is on the ground and read its text so I could determine whether or not perhaps it is an upgrade. Now, swapped out to it, it's a short sword. It's a little bit faster attack. It has a different style of attack attack as well, but things are starting to get very, very unpleasant indeed as we get attacked by these wraiths who are trying to horribly murder us. Not an easy game, certainly, although a lot of what I'm doing is really my own fault, more so than anything else. I'm not dodging, I'm not really blocking all that effectively. And I'm going to admit, I'll be the first one to admit that I'm absolutely awful at games like this, and I was awful at Necropolis as well, which is not too surprising, I would imagine. I'm going to swap out to the Pariah Blade here, which is a sort of short kind of crease, a dagger, which is used for various horrible rituals. Decide that's not very good, and then maybe we'll run off elsewhere. The amount of loot that drops is a little bit distracting at times. You have to learn to sort of differentiate between what the item is and whether or not it's worth picking up, because I suppose it's instinctual that you try and grab everything, but you have a very limited inventory in terms of the amount of weapons that you can carry, and all of these guys drop the same weapon anyway. It does mean that if you want a particular type of weapon, it's very easy to get. You've just got to hunt down the monster that drops it, and it will drop it every time. But it also means there's going to be a ton of stuff on the floor that you don't want to pick up. Thankfully, it doesn't automatically grab it, so I don't hate that system too much. It's not bad at all. Now we're surrounded, and we're going to get horribly murdered, and we're dead. There we go. And that resets everything. <laughs> and then you get mocked by the brazen god. Ha ha, you died and we're going to mock you for that. I suppose that's fair to some degree. You get the stat screen at the end, which is going to show you what you unlocked, as well as the number of hits you sustained, areas you explored, and all that sort of thing. And it's also going to tell you how many tokens you've earned as well, so that you can potentially spend them in the next run. You can customize your character a little bit in terms of appearance, although what's currently missing from this demonstration is any sort of class system. If you watch the trailer, you're going to notice a number of people that look very, very different that have different weapons and attacks. But as it stands, the only class we could play during the demo was a class with a sword and board. I could swap out my shield for a different kind of shield, and I could swap out my one-handed weapon, which would give me different abilities, but I was still stuck with the sword and board style of combat. That is, in my opinion, a very large limitation compared to games like Dark Souls, which let you equip a huge number of different weapons, which all have unique combat styles. Necropolis does not 
currently have that. And unless they implement that, I think that's going to be very, very limiting to people. They did mention they'd planned a number of different classes as to whether or not they're actually going to get in the game by the time this game comes out in summer of 2016. Now, that is a different question entirely. I think it's necessary. I really do. Either that or simply allow you to pick up different weapons that do have different combat styles. It's not to say the one-handers don't have different moves. They do, but they're still one-handed bladed weapons for the most part one way or the other. I didn't see any two-handed axes or dual wielding or magic or anything along those lines. And I think if you want that combat variety and replayability, you're going to need to have a little bit more than just the procedurally generated dungeons. You've also got to have that certain level of death tolerance in a game like this. You've got to be tolerant to restarting the game over and over and over again. And yes, it's nice that you explore a different dungeon every time. I agree. That, that's cool. But I want different weapon sets. I want different combat styles. I need that. I need it to be really different every time. And as it stands, at least within this demonstration, we didn't see that on display. There are, however, a couple of noteworthy features, including drop-in, drop-out four-player co-op, which is going to be quite interesting. And there's also friendly fire in the game. So there's a little bit of a co-optional element where your friends can end up turning against you to steal a piece of loot or whatever. They described it as an optional lowering of difficulty, just like Dark Souls, whereby if you summon friendly phantoms into the game, the game will get easier because you've got multiple players with you. It's going to have that, but of course, if you want to do a solo run, that's going to be the way that you are judged in various internet circles as to how good you happen to be. I can also see the potential for various daily challenge runs and speedrun attempts with a game like this, because it is not designed as a really long experience like Dark Souls. It's designed as a one death and you're done, dungeon run, roguelite kind of thing. So you're getting the sort of Binding of Isaac level of pacing where you can beat a run in, you know, 30 or 40 minutes, or indeed die much, much earlier than that if you don't live up to the challenge. I think there's definitely room for that, although it is starting to become a rather crowded market. That said, comparing something like this to Isaac is... Obviously, I don't think that fair. It, it, it's a very different game. It's obviously third person. It's Souls-like in many ways. It delivers the bite-sized portion of the Souls-like experience. It does not have a basic combat system. It's very well fleshed out in that regard. It just so happens that it's not a epic quest across a large number of different handcrafted landscapes. It is a randomly generated short run one and you're done kind of experience. Some people are going to hate that. And some people are going to say, well, the reason that Souls is good is because it's this massive handcrafted world with coherent lore-ish. And an interesting story-ish. And a lot of different bosses and meaningful progression through the world. The whole point is that you slowly progress through that world, making progress and growing your skill level to eventually beat the game after a very, very hard-fought set of victories. This is not that. This is, you go into the dungeon, you fight till you die, and then you come back, upgrade your dude, and go into a different dungeon. Not the same experience. Some people don't like that. Some people prefer that level of persistence and coherence. And some people like the quick playthroughs. So I think there'll be a little bit of cross-pollination in terms of the people that like this. I think that some of the Souls-like fans are going to enjoy elements of Necropolis, particularly the combat system. You know, it is very skill-based. Basic, relatively basic anyway, you know, it doesn't have a huge number of different attacks and weapon arts such as Dark Souls 3, although it does have some nice little elements, as I said, the stamina decay that I was talking about earlier that requires the food, and also the fact that you can actually coax enemies into fighting each other. If they hit each other, they have friendly fire also, and they might actually start a fight with each other. Very Quake-like, very Doom-like. Nice little element to that, but it's something that you can use against your opponents. It also has some fairly flashy effects, as you notice. You know, I like that nice little lightning flip that this dagger that I got can do. So that's not too shabby either. It's a simpler game than Souls is. No doubt about that. You know, there's no point in trying to dodge that fact. It clearly is. It doesn't have the level of complexity that Souls does. Doesn't mean it's bad, though. I actually rather enjoyed my time with Necropolis on the show floor. Although I was being murdered over and over again. What I would have liked to have got is actually some of the favor tokens to be able to unlock some of these codices to see what kind of permanent passive bonuses I could get for my future character. Unfortunately, I was not able to do that. 
primarily because I'm terrible. Let me show you the best run I've got with the best equipment that I've got so I can conclude this video here. I'm going to skip forward to the start of level 2. So here I'm able to talk to this vendor, grab some stuff here and there. I've got about 5 minutes left on the demo. But I'm ready to go down the elevator to level 2. I have reasonable-ish equipment. I've got some food. Some of it's rotten food. Maybe not ideal there. And uh, I will be able to progress at least as soon as I've grabbed enough currency from these pots over here to pick up a better weapon, a tier 1 weapon, something a little bit stronger. Let me show you what I got. We're going to use our 600 gems here to purchase a Pyramid Longsword, which is a tier 1 longsword. You'll see it's a nice little meaty weapon, got some nice big swings on it with the lightning power there as well. Certainly much more powerful than the weapon I had previously. This will hopefully allow me to survive in the next level of the dungeon, which we're now heading down to via the elevator right here. And you're going to see some different monster models and a bit more of a complex layout here as well. You also get a neat little overview. If you look down, you'll actually see some of the dungeon ahead of you. And the Brazen God is going to congratulate you for getting this far. Now, if you have completed some of the Brazen God's quests on level one, you will be able to open this golden treasure chest at the bottom here, which will hopefully give you some nice loot. If you haven't, well... You're gonna see what happens when you attempt it right here. Let's head over to the chest. What's in the box? Well, wouldn't you like to know? Earn tokens of favor and the Brazen God will actually tell you. He does love to taunt you that way. I will say that the sense of humor that this game has is something that does set it apart from, say, something like Dark Souls. It gives it a much lighter feel. Actually, it makes me more likely to play it, because I'm going to be honest, like, Dark Souls is oppressively miserable. Like, uh, I think a lot of people like that, but for me, it's like, God, this is stressful. I have too much stress in my life. I don't want to play this. I think some people are going to have that vibe, and this may be a game that appeals to those that want the, the snack-sized Souls experience. And they don't necessarily want all of the misery with it. We're going to grab the tier 1 Tefet shield here from this enemy as well, which is going to give us a little bit more power going forward. And you'll also notice some of the clockwork knights over to the right here, which are very, very difficult to deal with. You have to dodge their large telegraphed attacks or try to tempt them into attacking their friends. I'll use the lightning flurry here to do some decent damage and do the best I can. Now, at the end of the video, I will show you what happened when I took the wrong potion in the middle of a fight, because I think you'll find that quite amusing. But at the end of this 15-minute demo, they give you an arena fight in which they put you up against a bunch of skeletons, which will one-shot you with bombs, which is not ideal. You'll notice on the ground here the problem that I had with picking up the right item. I was wanting to grab that tower shield off the ground, but they currently have a bug in the game in which it's very difficult for the game to differentiate between the item that you want and the item you don't. They've definitely got to fix that because that's a bloody pain in the ass. It's especially true when you're trying to pick up like a potion or some sort of scroll which you might need in the middle of a fight and you can't grab it. Those are easy things that are fixed, though. The biggest complaint I do think I have based on the demo and based on all of the footage and information is just a lack of class variety. I spoke to the dev and he did say they had classes down on paper, but simultaneously we didn't see any of them and there's none of that in any of the pre-release footage or even any of the blurbs and press kits about it. So that makes me think you're going to be stuck with sword and board. That's a little too Zelda for me. You know, I, I want weapon variety. I want class variety. If I don't get that, I have a feeling I'm going to be less willing to make multiple playthroughs of this because I'm going to be stuck with the same combat style over and over again. I think that's a huge limitation. And I hope, certainly, that that's something that they are able to resolve and they put something a little bit different in the game. Either that or they have to differentiate the weapon loadouts a lot. Because as you've seen in this video, the only things we got were swords, daggers, and shorter or longer swords. You know, you can get a great sword, but it's not wielded in two hands. It's only one. So you're going to have the same sort of combat, even though there are a couple of different movesets available, regardless of what you pick up. That's a weakness. I, I really do think that's a weakness. I think that's going to limit the replayability and it also makes the playthroughs individually less interesting. So I hope they flesh that out. Outside of that, though, I think that the game has a decent amount of potential. I love the presentation. I think the nice clean aesthetic is very good. It helps you differentiate the background from the foreground, the enemies from the items and the obstacles and all sorts of things like that. I think it's, it's quite a simple art style, certainly, to create, but it's an effective one. I think it's quite striking in many ways. And I did enjoy doing multiple playthroughs of this. I'm just hoping that each playthrough is truly different because I did find that the individual playthroughs were quite similar. Again, it is a demonstration. It didn't have all the content in it, but I was running into the same kinds of enemies. I was getting the same sort of weapons every time, despite the fact that each layout was different. So 
having a procedurally generated level is cool and all, and it does help from an exploratory aspect, but if you're getting the same items every time, I don't necessarily see too much of a benefit to that particular system. All right, and now we get to die in the arena as we get bombs thrown at us, which instantly kill you, and the brazen god will laugh. Here's a complimentary death match. No hard feelings, he says. Boom. Dead. <laughs> Alright, I promised you that I'd show you the Paralyzation Potion. Let me grab the piece of footage that has that, and then I'll round this video up. This run was going so well. Unfortunately, our character needs food badly, and I don't happen to have any at the moment. I'm chased by a bunch of different enemies. Uh, pick up the vermin there, and you'll notice that that little pyramid-shaped vermin actually dropped a scroll. I've got to spend a couple of seconds standing over it in order to grab it, and I'm currently trying to kite a large group of enemies. <laughs> the pariahs that are trying to horribly stab me in the back as part of their evil arcane ritual. God damn it, go away! Chasing and chased around and around and around. Where I stop, nobody knows. And I think to myself, oh, I can grab that potion, and that might give me the health I need or the vigor that I need. I got, that sure is a magic scroll and an unknown potion, which I drank. Paralyzed me and got me killed. Welcome to roguelites. Aren't they bloody wonderful? Ugh. Part of me wants to hate that with every fiber of my being and another part of me can only just giggle at it and view it as kind of humorous. I suppose that's going to be very subjective. So I think Necropolis has a bunch of potential, especially in co-op. I just feel that right now... Combat-wise and weapon variety-wise, it is limited. But I will have to see the full game in order to really determine just how bad that limitation actually is. Maybe the limitation isn't there at all. That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Thank you very much for watching, folks. If you like the video, then by all means, do feel free to click the like button. Please do feel free to check out the other videos in the Avaganda series, which is a bunch of previews of exciting new titles from PAX East 2016. These include games like Pyre, as well as Katana Zero, Mirage Arcane Warfare, Elder Scrolls Legends, and so on and so forth. I've linked a couple of them at the end of this video, and if you just search on my channel for Avaganda, you'll be able to see some really cool exclusive footage of some brand new titles that you might not have seen before. I'll see you next time.